Welcome to Listening to Paint Drive with Mike and Dan, a podcast about the art and hobby of miniature painting. I'm Mike. I'm Dan. Thank you for joining us on our journey to become better, braver, and happy painters. Today we're going to talk about colors people commonly believe are difficult to paint. I'm going to talk about black and white because that's what kind of guy I am. Mike's going to focus on the sissy colors, red and yellow. Sissy colors, man. <laughs> that's where we're, we're, we're already starting that one. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Why not? Right. All right. All right. So. Why don't you talk? Why don't you talk to us about some boring black? And white I'm going white. to talk to you about the boringest colors out there. All color or no color, black and white. So if you were to search the internet and say, "What are? How do I paint this color? Or what are the?" What are the best colors to paint or something like that? Usually black and white are going to show up as some of the more difficult. I hate to paint those colors and topics. So I'm not going to get into the science of why those could be difficult. Um, because there's a lot more intelligent people and art know-how scientists that can tell why that that's our issue. Because I hate painting black and white myself so I'll start with black um, black seems to be fairly difficult with us because we put the color on and we are looking for some sort of depth we want it to look like um, things that we have around our house or things that we see that are black or we want to be black but in actuality they're really not black the deep dark shadows are but most of it's just gray is in whites and when we try to paint that, uh, some of the traditional ways of us starting to paint is a base coat and a highlight and shadows. But if we were to paint just a blob of black, well, uh, for some of us inexperienced or beginner or apprentice painters, um, we don't have anywhere to go. So we just throw on some highlights it could be um, lining with different different with different colors because actually it looks pretty cool uh, but we kind of lose that the shadow part um, and there there are some ways more advanced um, ways of painting black uh, what I typically do myself is just paint it dark gray or I'm what I hmm, let me go let me go back here for a second um, so for myself, I've always had a hard time painting black. Uh, most recently w with some of my paintings, I've been trying to move more towards, uh, grays and experimenting with how to develop those shadows and what I can do to make highlights without it looking like it's gray, because that's one of the problems when I first started painting was having an issue. Uh, so I try to stick with, um, black part of what I'm painting is being around 80 90 percent all black with a little bit of highlights uh, if you're a space marine player it's a lot easier to go just flat black and and add um, lining I for me personally that's the easiest and most effective way to paint it uh, a lot of people don't like lining um, you can also paint it dark gray and wash it all down with some nolan oil or some inks and that's not bad either. Uh, the, again, more advanced painters are going to um, have better techniques. But for tabletop, that works pretty well for me, especially for Space Marines, because that's what I focus on. Uh, white, I would say, is the same. Or hey Dan? Yep. Oh, can, what do you mean by lining? Lining. Like, when, when you say lining, are you talking about black lining, or are you talking about, like, edge highlighting? Edge highlighting. So when I'm discussing or saying, when I said lining, it was the edge lining. So using a lighter color uh, along the edges and sharp points, and then um, adding a lighter color to it, just to highlight where those areas are. Now, does when you're talking about that too, do you use multiple colors? Like, I hate to do this because I don't want to seem like a GW-centric thing, but, you know, it is this paint that most people start with when they get into the hobby is Games Workshop. So I know a lot of times in their videos they'll edge highlight with, say, um, something like a, 
a medium gray. Right, right, a, 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 yeah, medium bluish gray, and then go with like with a thick, a thicker edge highlight, or what they constant people constantly call a chunky edge highlight, and then kind of a finer edge highlight with something like Fermesian gray or a lighter blue gray. Uh, you it can, but uh, I, I think when you first start, you want to do that. But there's reflections coming from everywhere, and you want you can start to think about. Do you want to do cool colors or do you want it to be warm colors? So recently I've been playing with warmer colors. So using some browns in my highlighting because I want it to differentiate to different types of metals. So more of a plastically or a, a, a more subdued type of black compared to shiny, bright, new black. So and different materials also. So I've been trying to experiment with warmer blacks using those as highlights, even though traditionally we would use something a little bit more brighter. Uh, but it's around the app, the, the environment. Uh, there's lots of great examples of black armor with, with red edge highlighting or purple or green. There's some really, really cool stuff out there. Uh, so you, you really shouldn't be limited to just grays or the dark blues. Um, Usually, because there's a kind of connotation of which Space Marine unit you're using or um, which army sure. you're using, but um, if you're not using Space Marines and you want to do edge highlighting, well, it, it might have a different connotation or, or thought or um, meaning. But I use all kinds of different colors, purples. Uh, I do use some green sometimes, and it's good practice. So now, do you ever, like, when you're painting black, I've seen some people suggest, like, if you wanted to do a warm black, even if you're starting with a black base coat, like, do you ever just throw maybe a brush or two of red in there, even though it doesn't really change the hue, per se? Like, it doesn't push it towards black re a black-red mix, or um, do you find that's necessary? I find that's too advanced for me. <laughs> I want black. I want a pre-mixed black. And that's what I'm going with. So it's, it, you know, we can get into uh, advanced techniques of, you know, the deeper purples and blues that you put in shadows and how that makes it richer and more deep. Yes, you can. Uh, but I am not the person to show you how to do that or even discuss it. I know it exists. I know I'm not capable of doing it. Um, and there are some fantastic folks online that can show you that. So I'll leave it at that. Both Trevarian and Cujo on YouTube have videos about that. I actually haven't watched them all the way through yet, but um, about you know painting, adding that kind of tone to black. I'm not there either. You know what I mean? I'm not. I'm not a super artist either, so I'm still learning that crap too. So <laughs> I'm right there with you. So then we all, and then. The same side, but totally opposite, is white. Um, you would think that you would spray paint your Space Marines, Apothecaries, or whatever white, and you'd be done. Well, it, it doesn't kind of work that way. And um, I guess in the past, I would just do lighting. Or, I'm sorry. In the past, I would do... Uh, lining or just a wash to just get some depth in there but I find that very lacking and recently what I've been doing is actually starting the colors with our I've actually started using whites okay let me start that whole thing so recently I've actually started using light grays to bring out that white and I don't know how to explain it because I'm not super versed in all this stuff but putting the grays down light grays or if you want a warmer color using tans and cream colors and then painting white on top of that kind of gives you that idea of the white you're looking for without sounding stupid <laughs> um because there's no I, I i there is no such thing as uh, a pure white um and let's cross that whole thing out. That's not working at all. Um, you don't want to paint everything as white because we know that pure white isn't really a color and it doesn't look right when you're painting. 
um, unless it's a, a accent that you're using. So that's why I try to go with lighter grays or creams, depending if I want to go with the warm or cool colors. And just highlighting with white because on a tabletop, for me, I can tell that's white. Um, if I put a little bit more on there, you know, we were just talking about the, the thick lines and, and thin lines. Uh, just doing that is enough to say this is a white instead of a light gray space marine or whatever critter I'm painting that day. Um, so um, that's um, that's the, the in a nutshell for me and what I can actually explain without showing videos and pictures and demonstrating it. Um, there's lots of um, material out there, a lot more intelligent better painters than I uh, so that's why I did the easy one black and white so what about the silly colors you're using Mike what are you having problems with well but before we get into that I want one thing I wanted to add to is that when when you're painting black and white one of the things that puts them unique above other colors is that a certain a higher percentage of the miniature needs to be either black or white to read that way, and so if you're only doing midtone, midtone, and uh, like a, a brighter grays, and you only highlight with a pure white, then you run in that chance that it does look like a dirty light gray, or just like with black, if your if it if your midtone is really too much of a gray, then it's going to read gray, and so I think I believe it was either sixty or seventy percent needs to be white or black in order for it to read for your eyes to read it that way. I, I think I'm I, I'm not going to quote any type of scientific measurements and stuff, but I've seen sixty to seven uh I've seen sixty to seventy percent of that color has to be there and I've also seen eighty and ninety percent. So it really is like how do you feel about it? What is what are you trying to convey? You know it, yeah, you can have like pure black armor, but it, you know, for me, it's kind of flat nowadays. That's how I used to paint and I'm trying to improve. But mm -hmm. can I tell that that Space Marine is wearing black armor if I start to do weathering on top of it? I know it's black, but I just slopped on a whole bunch of, you know, buff color or sand color all over it. And it's all in the joints. Uh, theoretically, that wouldn't work right. But you know, hey, that's actually... A black armor and he's got dirt all over him okay and it just registers that way my eyeballs can't figure it out my brain can't figure it out it's uh late on a saturday sunday night whatever day it is <laughs> so <laughs> me trying to figure out why it looks black i just know it looks black but if i really stare at it it's freaking gray and brown right if you really if you kind of break it down if you try to take it piece by piece and the other thing that's unique too with white and black that is material. And that could be another whole conversation that, you know, when you're trying to paint, say, black armor versus black cloth, you really kind of have to have a bit of a different approach too, because black armor, the transitions are going to be sharper. You're not going to get as smooth of a gradient as per se on a black cloth. You know what I mean? You're going to get a much much bright, starker contrast yeah. in that. And then try, trying to paint something like white N N NMM. And I've seen, I think, was it Gareth Nichols has a t tutorial on Etsy about it. Uh, if you're brave, you should get it because it's, it, it's, it's a new way of looking at white for sure. But man, th thank you. Those are great tips for, for doing black and white, man. My silly colors, yellow and red, um, like black and white kind of have uh, a similar issue to each other and the main reason why yellow and red can be very difficult to paint and why people perceive it that way is because they're both paints by nature are very transparent or translucent however whichever way, way you want to go through it and so they're not typically opaque you can get opaque or reds like claims workshop makes a uh whatchamacallit line a baseline of paints and then vallejo has Heavy, heavy, the game color has the heavy paints, and then there's also some base paints in P3, et cetera, that are typically thipper, thicker, and, but a lot of those are not straight up saturated either reds or yellows, and so that's kind of an interesting thing. But 
There are a couple of keys to painting both red and yellow. The first is get some inks, uh, either Dalla Rowney red ink or yellow ink or scale 75 intensities. Those inks are going to make your reds and yellows so much better. And so for first a little bit, talk about red. And red presents a unique challenge because it's very tough to highlight. Um, most people typically will start dipping into yellows and oranges. I know like a lot of the Games Workshop recipes that they show, and I've even seen uh, people on YouTube who are painting other red figures red with other model lines, typically start adding yellow into, mixing yellow into red in order to increase its brightness. And the reason why they use yellows is because they don't want red to turn pink, which it'll do in a heartbeat when you add, add white to it. And so that's one of the neat things to have ink about is that, or ink in your arsenal is that if you start getting white, you take an ink glaze, which typically, what is it? For like a Dollar Rowney ink, it's like 10 drops of water to one drop of brush because inks are incredibly pigment heavy. And so they stretch a very, very long way. So you can get a lot of mileage out of just one brush of ink uh, with 10 brushes of water. And so you, pe you keep kind of putting red glazes on it and that will help bring it back to red and move it away from yellow. Like I recently painted a robot and I know we painted, we posted that on Instagram and posted again where I think it took me about, I hate to say it this way, but it took about 25 red glazes to get it away from pink. But I have to say, I love, I I'm glad I did all that extra work on the highlights because it increased the, quality of my gradients that actually made the transitions a lot better it took a little while i did have to bust out the hair dryer but it was actually worth it the extra work made it feel good you know what i mean like when it actually kind of looked where i wanted it to look i was kind of like all right that was if i knew that every time i was going to glaze away in margaritaville then i i would <laughs> i would be a lot happier with those results if it happened every time and so that's one of the tough things about red. The other thing that's kind of a little bit difficult about red, and this is true as yellow, is that because of the translucent nature, it's tricky to paint over a black overcoat because they're translucent. So it, you have to increase the number of coats you typically would do. You still want to do make sure you're doing thin coats to like get a base coat of a saturated red down. Or you could use a red that's that's got black mixed into it to get, to kind of get you towards the shadows already, increase your coverage because both black and white are good for coverages. And on white, when you brush paint, it could be a tip. It could be very difficult for yellow and red to get smooth coats because a lot of times what happens is you know when you thin a paint and you're using a brush, you kind of get brush strokes, and so you have to keep kind of you have to be fast, move the paint quickly. And you're going to have to do multiple coats of yellow and red over a white base coat. Now, of course, that is there's a simple solution to that. And that, of course, is using an airbrush. And since the airbrush puts down an even layer, you'll typically be you'll be able to do it a little bit quicker. You're still probably going to need a few coats. That's that's such as life. One of the neat things about red, though, is that you can do some fun shadowing. The easiest way to get a nice cold shadow on red is start adding in dark purples. Uh, that definitely, not only will that increase the contrast with a cool shadow and a warm highlight, but it'll also kind of give some depth and something interesting into it. Well, there's a color that I love to use to, uh, to shadow red. There's two of them. I usually typically start uh, the shadows with Sanguine Base by P3, and then I increase those with Burgundy Wine by Reaper. Sanguine Base is kind of a, is a dark red with a bit of a hint of purple. The Burgundy is purple on the brink of red. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's kind of got some black mixed in there. So it does actually look like a dark burgundy wine. And so it's a beautiful way to kind of build those shadows. And that's what's nice about red is you can do that. The other trick with red and making it look clean as far as contrast goes is you can start adding green into the shadows. Like for example, when I'm going into my deepest, darkest shadow, I take that burgundy wine and I add a dark green color, like a foresty kind of green color to it. Not a ton. You can't really see the green, but what it does, because you have the two colors mixed together that are complementing colors, what does it do? It creates a grayish brown. So now you've got an even nicer, deeper shadow that's got the complementing color built into it. So you're starting to tell the eye, 
as you're looking at it, that here is contrast. With that being said, too, one of the nice things about yellow, about red is if you use a non, an off white color. And so I'm trying to, th- I can't think of, I think it's swamp light yellow from Reaper. And the other magic color that's out there for highlighting stuff is ice yellow by Vallejo. Um, one of the things that you could do is sketch out your highlights with ice yellow and then glaze it with a red ink, or you don't even have to go with an ink. It's just going to take longer if you want to make a glaze from a paint, but a red paint. But that's a way to get a really beautifully saturated red. And you're going to have to work, and it's easier. It takes less time than if you were to use straight white because the yellow in there increases the luminosity of the red, if that makes sense. So adding yellow makes it more vivid, more saturated. So... Yellow can be a helper, but it's also a bit of a pain in the butt. But it's a lot of fun to paint at times, too. I found now that I'm, I'm hating yellow less as I'm experimenting with using different colors in the shadows. For example, a lot of times, you know, like there's a base color you can use. Uh, I think it's Avalon Sensor from GW. Um, heavy Gold Brown is very similar to that from Vallejo. And they're kind of an ochre, a darker ochre color. And that's a good way to start out if you want to paint yellow because you're now starting where you have some of your shadow built in and then you can build up the yellows. Kind of tough. But also you can use, I've seen now, I guess the Goobertown guy put in, started using pink to high, to shadow yellow, which is a thing of beauty. His, his work looks really nice. Uh, I like that idea. I know a lot of people are starting to use dark oranges and dark browns with kind of a red browns that lean towards red instead of like chocolate to shade. And so those increase the quality of yellow. And so one of the nice things about yellow is that it already has that luminosity already built into it. Uh, and so working towards a pure yellow, like I guess what uh, the brightest yellows are out there, like candlelight yellow from Reaper. I think it's uh flash gets yellow from GW is the highest yellow. And then, um, what is it? Bright yellow. It might be the bright ice yellow you could use to highlight regular yellow as well. So from Vallejo. So those, those type of paints have some more white in them. So their coverage is, is pretty good, but their luminosity is fantastic because they're super bright. They read bright yellow and bright, uh, right away and quickly. And so that's a good way to get contrast. And for yellow, you can also add purple to the shadows for yellow because guess what? Yellow and purple, complementary colors, increases grain. Yellow and purple go together really well, just like when you see a lot of people paint miniatures that have golden armor and golden pieces and they have like a purple cloak. Those really pop together as well. And so it's kind of a nice way to think about a color scheme. And so kind of like the the summary tips for for red and yellow is, first, you got to make sure that you get a good base coat down. You can, and it's going to take a few coats. Um, using colors like off whites, like a, a for red, using something like an ice yellow, and using gl- ink glazes to bring back the red, super easy, super rewarding. It'll give you a nice saturated co- saturated color, and also using complementary colors in the shadows really helps pop yellow and red. So use gr- help you add green to your shadows for red, add purple to your shadows for yellow. And you're going to start liking what you see, I believe, because you'll, you'll be able to get a good, vibrant color into them. So what about you with yellow and red? Are there anything fun fun with yellow and red that you like or that you do? You're not even listening to me. Dan. Hey, I'm back. Did I miss anything? <laughs> yeah, I just threw it to you. <laughs> what are, oh, are we still talking about? Uh, I'm done, yellow, but I'm done. I bet it. Those are great colors. I I like yellow and red. That's they're fun. They're fun to paint, like all the other ones. I usually use solid red and solid yellow. I don't like the transparent ones because I don't know how to paint black and white either. So. <laughs> I just I just paint what they tell me to paint on the little sheets of paper. You, you know how to paint yellow and red and black and white. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going to want to listen to us and say, hey, yeah, guys, we suck at painting. So can you. Right? You know, like, that's, that's, right. That, that, maybe Remember, that's our new motto. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying that I'm the 
best painter, the bravest painter, and happiest painter. I'm trying to get better, so I can't be perfect quite yet. Maybe episode 100, I'll be the bestest, bravest, happiest painter. Maybe, maybe okay. not. <laughs> if we get to episode 100, I'll be surprised, but you know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> me too. But hey, this quarantine's going pretty well, so you never know. Yeah, you never know. We got more, some more time on our hands, but... So, since since I did a smash up job of talking about black and white painting, do we happen to have like a real artist out there that's going to help us out and talk to us about this stuff? We actually, as a matter of fact, we do. We have an interview today with Matt DiPietro from Contrast Miniatures and Miniature Monthly. He's a former studio painter for Privateer Press. Uh, he is an award-winning painter as well. He's won things like Best in Show at the Nova Open. Um, he even ventured into winning awards into painting military models as well. So he's an exceptional artist. Both you and I have taken classes from him, uh, especially the blending, blending boot camp that we've taken, and it's a fantastic class as well. Yeah, listen to him. He'll show you or tell you how to like actually paint. <laughs> <laughs> Without further ado... Matt DiPietro of Contrast Miniatures. So, Matt, welcome to the show. Hi, Michael. Good to be here. So, so thank you so much for taking the time to talk uh, talk to us today. I know the world of COVID-19, uh, everybody's schedules kind of got weird. So I appreciate that you taking the time. Yeah, it's uh, not a problem. I, I work from home anyways. So really, with COVID, the big change is that my wife's here all the time working from home. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, you know, there's good sides and bad sides to all of that, you know. <laughs> um, yes, forever. we have to be flexible these days. <laughs> very true, very true. So, you know, let's start out. Can you tell me how you got into the hobby of miniature painting? Yeah, it was like a, it, it was you know, a long time ago. I was um, I got into painting um, and building models with my dad when I was like, you know, eight or nine years old, we would build like uh, tanks and aircraft. And uh, I built the like uh, DeLorean from back to the future and stuff like that, you know, kind of scale models. So it was something fun that we could do together with my dad. But um, then, uh, and also my, my mom was an artist. She would make artistic quilts and, um, you know, taught taught drawing and painting and stuff. Um, so when I discovered miniatures, it was kind of like a combination of those two things, and it really like clicked for me. Um, my first game was that I played was Hero Quest. Um, it was like a Milton Bradley game that they made with Games Workshop back in the day. It was kind of like a dungeon crawl sort of game, and that kind of got me hooked. And then after that, I found Warhammer, um, Fantasy, and eventually 40K as well, and those were the games I played all throughout my uh, like teenage years and into into my early 20s. Um, so there was a good probably like 10 10 years there of um, you know just like enjoying the hobby and painting and building models and everything like that before and uh, kind of like getting serious and as a career sort of thing. So um, what, what made you make the decision to take your painting to the next level instead of doing just kind of the gaming? When did you say, okay, I want to, I want to really do, I really want to be an artist with this. Yeah. It was like always this thing that was kind of in the back of my mind, like I'm trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and I would always see like on the, on the books and in, in the books and on the box covers and stuff, it's like, well, somebody painted that model like that goes on the box. Like, how do you get that job? You know, and at that time, you know, in the world, it was basically just like Games Workshop. So it was completely impossible, like a completely impossible dream for me to be able to do that. But I didn't I didn't know that, you know, so I was kind of like in the back of my mind, like, oh, maybe if I win a Golden Demon or something like that, I could work my way into it. But that's totally not the not really the case not true or whatever mm -hmm. but um it just committing yourself to something um you know you you can get lucky so um for for me i was always like i really into painting and you know um 
and I traveled my first time I ever you know traveled on an airplane by myself was to go to Golden Demon when I was 18 years old um, and compete in in Chicago you know so that was a big thing for me but um, at the time like you know Games Workshop in the UK isn't gonna like hire somebody from the other side of the world they're gonna hire somebody from you know in, <laughs> from England right, right. To, they have the studio painters yeah. Yeah, so I was just lucky that Privateer Press, um, you know, started up a company in Washington State. You know, not that far from where I lived. I st- I had to move um, to to take the job, but um, you know, it was like a big step for me. And it's not like I got hired as a studio painter. I got hired um, packaging models in their warehouse. You know. <laughs> So, and, but I'm like, this is my chance. I'm gonna take the, I'm gonna take this chance. I'm gonna move there and take like a, you know, minimum wage job packing models in the warehouse, just so like I can, um, you know, make that contact with the studio and be like, this is what I want to do, you know. And if it doesn't work out, I'll figure out something else I'm gonna do. But like, this is what I'm gonna do. So, um, I had a, the guy that used to own the game shop. I, I grew up going to like he was the first editor at um for of no quarter for um Privateer press so i kind of got in touch he got in touch with me and been like hey you know i have this in i can get you an interview in the warehouse it's not the same thing but you know so i said yeah you know um so i had probably like <laughs> and it took me almost a whole year to like you know get that one shot at the dream, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like um, at the time, the studio director was Mike McVeigh, um, and for the listeners that don't know, like Mike McVeigh was basically like the the first um, like star miniature painter. I think Duncan Rhodes of the of the '90s, basically. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but unlike Duncan, he moved on to like become a sculptor and then head of the studio at, at Games Workshop. And like basically would manage all the sculptors and and the you know so he was like one of the you know um, probably the next wave after the founders of Games Workshop basically you know right. pretty important guy and and he's a great great painter and, and sculptor and stuff uh, so when Privateer Press started they hired him at, to manage their studio and his wife was Ali McVeigh was the like head studio painter there. Um, so I got to know them and he's like, well, like give you your shot at, um, you know, maybe become a studio painter one of these days. Um, but it turns out that they were actually planning to move back to the UK. So they ended up leaving like, I don't know, maybe six months after I started doing work for the studio. And right. then the other studio painter there became, the head of the studio, Ron Cruzy, you know, used to paint for for Mike, and then he became he kind of took Mike's job when Mike left, and then I took Ali's job, and I was the head studio painter there, and and then that was kind of how like I got my chance. But what one thing I want to say about it is that you know, um, for what like this particular dream of you know becoming a miniature painter like kind of full time is like way more achievable these days than it was back then for anybody just with the in- advent of the internet and like all the opportunities to you know get your work out there also the the hobby is like way bigger as far as the volume of people these days so there's a lot more opportunity out there but also just like in general maybe like people just want to be you know, good painters, they like being a painter, but they don't want to be like, you know, do it for a living or something like that. Maybe that sounds terrible for them. So they probably have some other dream that they want to man- they want to achieve. And um, I would say like the secret to luck, because like it always, luck is always like a uh, like factor in that, um, is just keeping your eyes open and being willing to like jump at an opportunity when you see it. Um, and just like, and not only willing, but like preparing your life to be able to jump on an opportunity is like part of that success. So, um, like that's, that's, that's a skill. An incredible story, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I appreciate it, man. That's the, I, I like the boardroom to uh, the the mail room to the boardroom. You know, that's a, that's an awesome situation. Uh, I don't you don't hear about that very often. You know, it's more it, it, like you you chase that dream, and, and it may not have been Games Workshop, but you know, Private Tier Press is pretty still damn impressive. So, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, and then like after you achieve one one dream it's like i think it's almost like human to not to not be to look to what comes next and stuff so um for me that was leaving and starting my own uh business where i could um determine for myself what kind of work i wanted to make and like how to balance my work life balance and all of that and not have a boss that i'm working for you know cuz there's a lot more creative opportunity there um, and kind of do more of, the, of what I wanted. So, like, um, to make that work, I kind of had to prepare in the same sort of way, you know. Um, and I think that's a skill that maybe is overlooked by a lot of people, and they can kind of get focused in on, like, how impossible some dream might be, you know. So, um, yeah, preparing yourself little by little and then, like, getting ready, readying your life to make some big change and big big leap and then, you know, just like going all in on it um, at the right time, you know, can can be the bit, make the big difference. And it's true for everything. That, that, yeah, that's it, you got to take risks, right? If you if you don't take risks, you stay in the same uh, same ho- kind of humdrum situation and, and you never get where you want to go. Right. Yeah. Well, also, if you're not willing to be uncomfortable, you have to. <laughs> it's like really. I mean, if it was easy, if it was comfortable, like you're going to have a hundred other people competing with you to do the same thing or a thousand other people, you know, so like putting yourself outside your comfort zone and uh, just like taking that plunge and realizing that it's going to work out one way or the other. You're going to either learn something valuable or you're going to have like an incredible experience that can lead you somewhere that you didn't even imagine. So, um, yeah, it can be really good. So while, while you're in that process now, so you've gone from, uh, you know, a, a gamer, a gamer painter, you're working in the warehouse. Now you're a studio artist. Did you, what were the challenges as a studio artist that you found? Like one of the things that always pops in my head when people say doing this for a living is I don't think I could do, I, I know personally I couldn't do it because it would then turn into a job for me. Um, and so how were you when you were doing the, that type of work, like the studio work? Yeah, I think that, um, well, for one thing, I think that it, that, that change from like job, like, uh, like a, um, passion to a job. Um, I think that you can hold on to that passion. It's all about your attitude, but I think that it's just like, because of human nature, you go through like phases. Sometimes you'll be like, oh man, I'm really, really burnt out and I can't stop because if I stop, I get fired or something like that, you know? And those times are the bad times. And other times you're like, wow, I just painted this really awesome model. I'm, I'm digging this. Like, I love seeing this up, up there and like, um, or, you have a really good experience with somebody you're able to like make a connection with, or you can see um, you can help somebody out with their own painting and get, so there's a lot of things that can like add positive momentum. And then, and then usually like the negative momentum is like something internal, some way you're like approaching, um, you know, life in this experience, but it is a really high stress job. Like, um, it, well, I wouldn't say high stress, it can be high stress, but more like high pressure because the way the, you know, just the, the system works is it's kind of like um, the people coming up with the brief, the, is, it, the, the idea for a model goes from like a written brief into, and that brief is given to a concept artist. And then that concept artist like gives their concept work um, and there's an approval process and all that stuff for each of these stages, you know, that concept, artist gives that to a sculptor that sculptor you know turns in that sculpt and then that sculpt has to be turned into a model by you know people in a mold room and then only then do you actually have the model to paint well like it usually happens that like 
the people coming up with the brief, they have a ton of other things to do, you know, so the concept artist gets it a little bit, a couple weeks late, and the concept artist kind of like drags his feet, you know, and is a week or two late, and then the sculptor can, <laughs> same sort of thing. So everybody's late, and then like it lands on your desk, and it's like, it needs to be done in three days, otherwise the product gets um, uh, delayed because, oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so this would happen or, or it would just be like a feast or famine sometimes. So sometimes like you have to find things to do or like answer people's questions online or like, you know, these other little ancillary things. And the other times it's like, hey, here's 10 models like on your desk, you know, get it done, you know, find a way to do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's and, 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 and your boss is not going to be like the only thing they could say to help you is like I don't know paint the fronts only and it's like you never want to do that because then it's kind of like you you know at some point you're going to have to paint the backs of those models and it's basically going to be like painting it one and a half times each time you know right you have to yeah so it's like I would never do that I would always paint the whole model but um, I don't know I think it made me a better painter. It definitely may be a lot more efficient because, like, there's a lot of inefficient ways to paint, and it might make, like, a really great-looking model, right? But if it takes it too long, it's not going to get done. Or And that's true for the studio painter, and it's also true for the normal painter. If anything, the normal painter, like the everyday painter, you know, hobby painter, like, um, they have a li very limited amount of time to paint, usually. Um, and if anything, efficiency is more important for them. But um, it's something that's kind of like not really um, focused on so much. Um, so when I teach, I kind of like work in the efficiency stuff all the time into my own uh, teaching as well, because I think that it, anybody can benefit from it. It's not about like rushing or like uh, cutting corners or something like that. It's more just like about like finding an easier flow, an easier way to get the same results, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's like been very um, beneficial for me in my own painting and also something that I can pass along to people. I think that's really good. So. Right. You know, and that's, that, that, I, that was kind of what I was going to ask uh, at, as a follow up with it was, um, so now with all these models that you have to paint at one, at one time, you know, because of that type of scenario, um, like what, I guess maybe I'll ask it this way. Was this, was when you were faced with that situation, uh, had you already used an airbrush before or is that type of thing? Is that, did that get you into airbrushing at all or? <laughs> um, I started, um, yes and no. Like I started using the airbrush for the private press studio stuff on when we started doing colossals and gargantuans, okay. really big stuff because that's really where the airbrush shines on smaller stuff. It's not as one. It's not as much of a time saver, um, because and also there's always going to be a cost to using the airbrush, a time cost that you have to sink into it, because there's a startup cost to using it, like where you're mixing all the paint to have the right consistency so it doesn't clog, um, and then there's a cleanup cost where you have to clean up the airbrush after every like paint you use, and that's mm -hmm. a significant time cost. So like. Um, I wouldn't use the bear brush at all on you know most things, but on really large stuff, it's like a big um, like time saver. So um, or I mean even when, if I'm doing units and stuff like that, I wouldn't use the airbrush. And there was a lot of reasons for that. Um, mm. You do really want a very consistent look throughout the line, and it's the airbrush um, it can it doesn't really provide the same like uh, finishes um, as uh, models painted um, in the private press studio style. Like, uh, but when you get in the big, the big scale or whatever, um, even then airbrush would only be the beginning of the process. It would basically save you a bunch of time at the beginning and then you use the brush for the rest of the model to do all of the like sh shading and highlighting and nuances and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Was, so then what's like the technique of like two brush blending, was that developed out of like kind of an efficiency? I know that a lot of people credit uh, kind of the P3 paints for being designed for, 
you like really kind of designed for two brush blending was that i mean do you feel like that the that type of blending technique is something that is more efficient or did it have an efficiency value to it it definitely has like a huge efficiency value to it i think that there's there's a lots of different efficient ways to paint and i know i mm-hmm. teach lots of different different ones i'm talking like totally different methods other than the private to press style sure. um i think the two brush method of blending can be very efficient, especially like with the number of steps involved. Like for example, like to get like your perfectly, um, you know, uh, like get the studio style of, of um, for the prior to press stuff, it usually would be like four or five steps. You know, there would be a base coat, two shadows, and two highlight colors. Sometimes only one highlight color, and then and that would be it. So it was kind of easy to kind of break it all down, and usually like um, you know, you would either use be using paints out of the pot or like a 50/50 mix of two different paints. That's how I kind of like tried to like structure the painting, you know. Um, that's, but no, that's super smart. Like every company has kind of their, I mean, the GW style model is very distinctive. You know, you got the base coat wash one or two highlights, right? You know, <laughs> like that, yeah. that's kind of their methodology. And so that's interesting that that privateer press had it broken down that way too. Uh, and, not and, the same way, but had, had, a, had their strategy too. I think that like uh, it kind of comes from um, Mike McVeigh and him being, you know, from the Games Workshop studio, it was kind of like the the philosophy was this like you know efficiency, but also making things look really good. But as far as but we would have had a different scheme as far as like um, how we painted. So we didn't paint in the Games Workshop style of like washes and dry brushes and have this like painting in relief. You know, we p- tried to we tried to paint as if there's a light being cast on the figure, which Games Workshop doesn't do. Um, right. But, uh, like, I learned to, to, to brush blend from Mike and Ali and Ron, um, so it definitely came from them. But, um, like, I didn't get that much time with them before Mike and Ali left for the UK. So I kind of like reinterpreted all of the paint schemes because they left very abruptly. Um, It was kind of like a, (laughs) you know, (laughs) I found out one day and then we didn't see them again, you know, sort of like leaving. So, um, so I would get Ali's models and I'd be like, okay, how does she do this? Like that's that's how I learned it. <laughs> so and and through that process, I kind of like changed things and like and and re reinvented the the standardized method of painting all every all of the armies. Um, and then when a new army would come up, um, I would get the paint scheme because the paint schemes were always developed by the owner of the company, Matt, Matt Wilson. And then uh, I would get that paint scheme and have to interpret how to make that with my, with the paints that we had. Um, right. Yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Do you, do you mind if I switch gears a little bit? I actually sure, sure. yeah, like absolutely mo- move into the teaching side of it. Cause that's actually one of the things I, 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 I love, I, I, you know, I'm married to a teacher and so, you know, t- teachers are, are are awesome. And so I wanted, I wanted to see what made you make that decision to start uh, teaching classes. Yeah, I mean, like, it's something that I had always kind of been um, interested in being a teacher. Um, be- maybe because I did have the best experiences with teachers when I was growing up or I had troubles in school and that sort of thing. So I, I and like, part of, part of my mind, like, always wanted to kind of, um, you know, maybe do I could do better than that or so if I if the whole like uh painting miniatures for a living hadn't worked out uh I probably would have you know become a school teacher or something but it just sort of happens like um I so I always kind of had that desire to to teach and I thought I I, I was good at it but it's it's um it's always a challenge um like it's of course like as part of being a uh, studio painter part of your job is 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 teaching people how to paint you know the models for your company or whatever but i always found that it was very limiting um you know because you could only use the products that you're selling um 
that company was selling it or and um, the format you know the written format in these books and stuff like that usually you end up defaulting to just like talking about the recipes and and the steps that you took rather than actually teaching people how to paint so um, as I when I left private chamber press and I started my own company contrast miniatures I knew I wanted to like make teaching a big part of that uh, because I had all this pent-up energy like I felt like I had been you know I had been teaching people but I hadn't really been teaching people how to paint it was more like I was teaching people the process I was using to do my job you know mm -hmm. um, so kind of like I factory re production right like it's more like factory production than the artistic side right yeah, I mean, like, those resources are great to teach somebody how to be a studio painter for Privateer Press or how the studio models were made. But it didn't actually teach people how to, you know, to brush blend or, you know, any number of the other types of blending techniques that I've start I've used. Like, I teach five different ways of blending mm -hmm. right now. You know, each one has its own strengths and weaknesses. Um, uh, and I wanted to be able to share that with people. And then also, like, you know, when I left Privateer, my method of painting totally changed. You know, I had all these different methods I wanted to, ex wanted to explore. And in my painting in my own personal life, the stuff I was doing for myself and for to compete in competitions and share with the world as, like, this is, like, the best I can do, it was far beyond what I was doing in the studio. So that was a big, like, um, driver for me to start my own thing, too. Um, but then also thinking about, like, what is really the best way to get people started paying, painting miniatures? Because it's not the way the game companies are teaching people. You know, um, those way, those methods of painting are more designed to, to give somebody a product that is going to solve whatever their perceived problem is, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. But the, but the truth is, like, it's always going to be some relationship between your tools and your skills, right? And the game companies aren't teaching people like a lot of skills, you know, they're teaching again some process, usually to tie into some sort of product line, right? Mm -hmm. They're not teaching people art. I wanted to be an art teacher, you know, I wanted to teach people the art of painting miniatures. Um, right. So that was kind of the goal I've um, taken to heart with my teaching, and I teach in all sorts of different ways. Um, at conventions, that until this year was a big thing. I've, right. all, <laughs> yeah. all that business business has been lost, and it's been like a you know big financial burden for my business this year. But we adapt, and I've been teaching people online through online coaching, um, and you know people will sign up with me through uh, the patreon that I make videos for miniature monthly for coaching or just like um, contact me through my website to to meet up for little coaching sessions and that's been really cool cuz i can kind of tailor um, the class to wherever that person is you know and really like um, talk about their painting and, and show them the next step rather than uh, you know, just talk about how I paint, which might not be as applicable for somebody of where they are at, you know. Um, and then, so, and of course, I, like on that topic, I also, you know, make videos these days and, and share my teachings that way. And then even um, one thing that I started doing this last year, which, um, Hopefully we can do more of um, in the future once COVID kind of dies down is um, private coaching, like one-on-one -on -one in my in my in my studio, which has been just really wonderful. Um, I like recently moved to just like an hour and a half away from Seattle, kind of in the country and and really beautiful. We're like a, five minutes from the beach and the water and everything and. Um, it's just really, really nice here, and I have a nice big space and like a uh, guest bedroom, so people will travel from all over the country and either even like parts of different places in the world. They'll come and uh, want to visit Washington State and also take classes with me. So they stay a couple nights, and and we do coaching in my in my home, you know, and everything's like tailored to whatever they want to learn, wherever they wherever they are with their with their um, with their learning, um, wherever they are with their painting, and uh, it's been just been really good because you can see, like, 
all those breakthroughs happen all at once. It's like this really intense experience. And like, I just, I just love to see the students improve, you know, after that and just like have these like, sort of eye opening, um, like painting experiences. So that's the, been the type of teaching that I've been enjoying the most. Um, mm -hmm. And also, one -on -one. yeah. But... It can be a nice little like vacation, you know, because it's a a beautiful place where I live, and it's like it's not even rainy here um, as much as Seattle. It's weird because we're like in this like little microclimate caused by the mountains, so like we're in the rain shadow of the mountains of the Olympic Peninsula. Um, oh, anyway, cool. it's like yeah, so we get like twice as many sunny days as Seattle. But we actually get the same amount of rainfall, so it's not like really dry here. It's just mm -hmm. that it rains like really heavy when it rains, and then it's sunny. <laughs> so. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine from an artistic side that like in things like spring and the you know in spring it it kind of explodes with colors. You know, it's something amazing to look out there. I'm sure. Yeah, that we have these. Um, uh, amazing rhododendron bushes here that have just exploded in like reds and pinks and magentas and we have these awesome hummingbirds which will come and visit my studio window um and they're always fun to watch and we just like have wildlife here there's otters that live in the ocean i i i notice from time to time i, I like to post all these little like animal pictures and <laughs> nature pictures and stuff like that i think that's my new hobby is like being out in nature and and building a little garden and and kind of like these sorts of things I, I start to enjoy more and more as I get older I think yeah. so you know I, I we, we were talking a little bit before the the interview started um, you had mentioned that you had even done private coaching for couples etc um, and so and one of the things that we talked about was kind of like a, a healing nature of art can uh, we talk a little bit about how what art has meant for you, um, and also, I mean, it can be you know any art it doesn't have to necessarily be miniature painting. We, uh, we're not exclusive to that, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I do do um, like uh, kind of uh, couples packages, you know. So like, um, it's not as much as like two people coming to coach. If it's like a couple who want to come and like have a a nice experience i like i try to encourage that because i think it can be really great you know sometimes i think that something i'm cognizant of is that like um when you have this uh hobby that you're really passionate about it can be great if like um your spouse can enjoy it and be a part of it even if they're not as into it as you are you know um mm -hmm. and and maybe they are maybe it, that's it if they are, then that's, that's great. Maybe you're at very different skill levels though, or something like that, you know? Um, so like, it can be kind of a fun experience to get people together and have this, uh, sort of shared experience. If you can share your hobby together, it can be, it can be fun. And it can be great to kind of, um, just watch kind of, that kind of bring bring people together bring couples together and for me like personally like art really um provided an outlet for me when i was going through sort of tough times as a teenager you know i was like being bullied a lot and i had like really bad acne that was super painful and uh you know just like having a really rough time of it and it was like you know i i would come home from school just like having been you know, emotionally pummeled all day and being able to go into this quiet room and be alone and, with my art and just paint these things and, and be able to like escape into some sort of fantasy world um, that where I could do something that I was good at and made me feel powerful. You know, I think that was like a really, you know, powerful thing. And I think that that's what kind of hooked me on art because it kind of saved my life at that point. Um, and it still kind of um, it still provides that like emotional outlet. It can continue to um, evolve and feed back this positivity. I think that if um, if you nurture your art and like have it continue to feed positivity to you, then it can be just really um, a great place to go when whenever you need it. You know. Um, 
and it can just be this really uh like positive thing in your in your life now we have we all have like kind of a can we can have like troubled um relationships with our art sometimes where maybe we're going through negative emotions about our art you know that's always a problem that you have to kind of manage and 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 learn and maybe maybe it's like a skill that you learn to uh to have a positive sort of relationship with your art and something that i've had to had to learn over the years i think there's definitely been times where i haven't had such a positive relationship but these days it's been going good um but it's, it's something that everybody struggles with so sometimes as a teacher that's something that i try to teach as well you know and it's not just about the skills and um uh the methods and stuff sometimes it's like learning about how to have a good relationship with yourself you know um through your art yeah and well, um I, yeah go ahead no, no, i i want to cut you off no please no I, this no. is good stuff i didn't uh, you know i was just gonna say i can relate to the definitely to the bullying aspect you know i was uh five foot four until my seven until this summer between my junior and senior year and i was the kid with the giant glasses i'm the captain of the debate team and uh you know all, all around nerd that was teeny tiny you know and so i i totally get it and my senior year was totally different because I, I grew seven inches over that summer so you know i came, I came back uh, from a debate workshops you know six foot one which was for then pretty tall <laughs> you know, you know, so then then things got a little bit better but i told i totally get it i used to draw ninja turtles that was my i my my number one artistic dream when i was growing up so i wanted to draw for eastman and laird for the ninja turtles and, <laughs> but, you know it you know, hey, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, w I, w I wish I would have kept those freehand skills up. I, I find that's a struggle, and, and now for me is to get back into uh, freehanding. Yeah, like it's, I, you know, I always used to think of how natural a thing it is, and I think there are people that have absolutely natural freehand skills, but I. I know what I used to be able to do and where I am now. And I'm like, wow, it's going to take me a long, I'm just going to have to start picking up pad and paper and just draw again, you know, to get back in that freehand world. Um, I think you find that like it comes fast, it comes back faster than it took to learn it the, the first place, like much faster. Um, and sometimes I even find like when I take breaks from things like and come back to it, I will have like even more skill. It's almost like your brain is like kind of working through, percolating through these problems that maybe you were struggling with before um, if you take a break. But um, yeah, like there's nothing wrong with just like starting to, you know, do like draw or do art or, or whatever. Like um, you don't have to have like a certain like level of skill that you want to achieve. Maybe you just want to like, uh, you know, enjoy it, try to focus on the enjoyment of it. You know, this is what I'd say. Nice. Um, so, you know, one of the things that that has always impressed me with you as an artist is you have the ability um, to kind of switch mediums. And so, I've noticed that you've done gaming figures, you've done larger scale figures and busts, and I've also seen that you've had success in the world of kind of historical figure painting as well, which is impressive. Very few people cross over those things because they're kind of different they seem to be different worlds but uh, i'm wondering if you could share um first of all what what kind of process that you take when you approach kind of a larger figure than let's say a gaming figure or maybe even incorporate kind of a bust into that as well if you if you wish yeah um yeah i guess i can talk a, a bit about that like um these days i actually have a few different processes like to choose from and the process I choose has more to do with like my particular vision for that piece than uh, necessarily the scale or the subject. Well, I mean, the subject matter comes into play with that too. But if I'm going to be painting something that is like, you know, more of a scene that's like outdoors and so it's just sort of generally lit from above. I'm going to approach something different than somebody that has like an extreme lighting situation going on. Um, and I also, I try to like let my, let these sorts of methods like flow together into something that's organic when I'm painting it. That's usually where I'm having the most fun. 
Mm-hmm. But and then I've kind of come up with or I've adapted a really classical um, way of painting um, into how I paint my gaming models. So I have this uh, method that I, I've kind of uh, branded as sketch style. Right. Um, but it's actually based off of a, um, you know, classical type of painting that's hundreds of years old. And that type of painting is called grisaille which it's obvious why I wouldn't uh, call call it that because people would be like, what's this weird word I've never seen before? You know, <laughs> right. it, it kind of turns people off. So like, that's why I've kind of branded it as sketch style. It's, and it's about like painting just in black and white and then adding color through transparent glazes and stuff. Um, so that's how I paint all my like, uh, like stuff. Um, gaming commissions, you know, I don't take commissions like painting a whole army in like a studio level. You know, I used to do that for my job. I don't do that anymore. Like, you right. know, Can't like I'll paint, you. I'll paint single models. I paint like single characters and stuff, and I call that display quality. Um, so that's like, you know, a studio level paint job is like display quality, and that's like my mid range, and mm-hmm. um, and that's usually like either you know, really, really nice paint jobs of a model that's out of the box or slight conversion, you know, something Mm -hmm. like that. And then the stuff that is basically like at the same level or is actually stuff that I would be painting for myself is what I call my fine art um, level of painting. And that's like totally open. Usually it's reinterpretations of work or very like elaborate they can be elaborate conversions or just like a reinterpretation of the sculpt using just paint sometimes. Um, but it, they're usually not gaming models um, and they're not designed, they're designed without gaming in mind at all, you know, so they're, they're on like a display base or something like that. And, and that's why I would bring to show off at a convention or something these days. Um, and I'm very like, I'm uh, so like I would never get bring a gaming model to a competition anymore um, because um, if I'm going to paint something to my highest level, I want it to be something that's like me that that is like comes from from inside, you know, like that deals with you know either some emotion I'm having or has some story that you know kind of blossomed into my mind or something. I want to express myself. Um, so like and that's that's and that's a commitment I've made to myself. Um I love gaming and I love, you know, these miniatures and it's great to like get a miniature out of the box, build it and paint it really nicely. And that's what my display quality stuff is. And I enjoy that just as much as, you know, painting the fine art stuff. But it's I just like to draw that line, you know. Um so that makes sense. I mean, you have to, it's kind of different places, different processes that, you know, I, I, I totally get that. Now, along that same lines, I was wondering, so if we, we were to say, you know, you know, Matt, pick up a model um, that you kind of see and gives you an inspiration type thing. What, what, what do you kind of, do you have anything in particular you look for in a model um, when you want to paint on a kind of a fine art level? Yeah, like, it's hard to say, um, Mm -hmm. because sometimes, like, a model will really inspire you with some sort of new story. Like, because I made this commitment that, like, the idea really has to be at least partly mine, um, that really, like, changes the whole perspective, you know, because you're not going to, you know, paint some World of Warcraft miniature, for example, because that's not your idea, you know, that's, like... World of Warcraft's idea, you know, or a lot of times, or I want to paint a Games Workshop model to my highest standard and in, 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 in competition because, you know, I'm just, that's their intellectual property. And, and for me, like at this point in my career, um, at my development, I want to be like making something that's like really something that somebody hasn't seen, um, something that like is something I want to express. So, and it can be really weird, like, uh, what it will, like, click for, for you. Sometimes you just see a model or a 
a figure and you have some idea, like some sort of weird take on it, you know, some sort of riff on that thing, you know, or maybe we'll start with the idea and you look for models that you could turn into that idea. Um, right. And it all, so it's always like, I, it, I mean, unless you're sculpting it for yourself, you're going to be in some sort of conversation with the sculpture itself, you know, but you want to add you you want to add your own like um yeah you want to be part of that conversation not just like you know um uh like painting something just really nicely you know it's more like um what's the idea behind this like that so i can make it my own so i can make it unique um and sometimes it, like uh, yeah, it's so ha sometimes having a sculpt that is open to interpretation can be a big part of that. Um, uh, those sculpts that you see painted like by a bunch of top artists or something like that, there is a certain the sculptors are, can be really good at like leaving it open for the artist to interpret it. But other times, like I'll be taking multiple sculpts, cutting them up, and putting them together into something completely new. Um, so. Right. Or I'll do be doing a tribute to a different a certain artist that I like. Like sometimes I'll I'll do that, um, or a piece of, uh, or so I do sometimes do like pop cultural themes, but I try to only do that a little bit. So like and stuff and the theme and usually it'll be like um, reinterpreting a bust into uh, something that it wasn't originally intended to be, you know. Yeah. Would that be like the like the the fisherman you did that one uh, best in show a few years ago at Nova Open? Now that originally that that bus didn't come with the fish, right? You had put the fish on it, right? Yeah, that was a big conversion. Um, yeah. uh, the the interesting thing about it, it was actually the same sculptor, but I cut up two different uh, ones. The, the fish came from this uh, Inuit um, fisherman, so it was a historical mm -hmm. sculpt, and then there was the sci-fi. Um, you know, sort of spaceman bust, and right. then um, so I took that fish and I put it on on his back and came up with this whole idea that was inspired by the Cassini spacecraft. So Cassini was like around the around Saturn at that point, taking pictures and everything. And I was really into astronomy and um, you know space and everything. My dad worked for NASA and I was always into that sort of thing. Um, so like I was really inspired by Cassini and it was just thought it was like, you know, all this stuff we were learning about the moons of Saturn and it just brought this idea in my mind about how um, uh, people are gonna have to learn how to survive again. You know, nowadays life is easy but when you leave, I mean, you leave Earth, you know, like everything good that's good and warm in the universe is a here and not out there. It's like so. It's like this person is tough and like you know maybe age past his years, and so you can see this like in his face, and, but in his eyes you see the like sort of longing and wonder for. Um, discovery you know so you can kind of try i was trying to i'm always i'm always like um attracted to uh these things that are two contradictory things being expressed at the same time so at least in the the face it was that but the fish the fish um i did a lot of conversion for because um the sculpture for um was like only really half a fish like the sculptor <laughs> cut off half the fish probably to conserve material, you know, because the more material that goes into a sculpt, the more expensive it's going to be. That's just how right. it goes. And, you know, you don't want to have to try to expect people to pay $90 for a bust, you know. It's kind of a hard sell. So in any case, I had to sculpt the back half of the fish and make it to match which was uh, difficult. And then there was a lot of carving into the resin and stuff to get it to fit around his neck. And I added these little tentacle, little bioluminescent whiskers to the fish because it lives in like a completely dark place, you know, on the moon of Saturn. So I like to call it a space bass 
<laughs> but yeah, yeah, it was just fun to come up with these these little stories. I don't, sometimes I don't even know where they come from, and it's almost like um, I dig down into that story and try to figure out like what it is, like what emotion or what like concept I'm trying to express, uh, or I, it, it is, which, what is trying to come out, you know, and that as I'm working, so. Sometimes the idea is not even completely crystallized in the mind before you start working on it. And there's a certain process to that, too, leaving it open to change and to, to uh, working through the ideas as you, as you go. Um, it can feel uncomfortable, but in the end, like, it's really rewarding. So, yeah. No, I mean, it, it's, it's impressive because I know even, like, you know, uh, e- uh, even in art, and other forms of art, like writing, you know, like Red Side, there was something by Stephen King that said he starts out with a concept. He doesn't know how it's going to end. He just takes the journey, you know, and so that's kind of cool, too. It kind of goes across genres and mediums and such, you know, so that's very that's that's very cool to hear how that type of model uh, came to. And one thing I wanted to point out, too, is this. And I try to do this every time because I'm, I'm a person who struggles with the concept of contrast. But like you said, the expressing two different competing or contradictory things that's a form of contrast too right you know even you can write the put contrast in the story of a miniature not just in light and dark right yeah that's like a deep insight i think that that's totally true and something that's really overlooked we're also like <laughs> uh, uh keyed in on all the other types of contrast they're trying to use to tell whatever story we have that um but um you know, just having that contrast in the story itself is very, it's not only like um, more attractive and, um, but it also is like a very, I think very human, you know, we're, we're a collection of contrasts in, in ourselves in a way. Um, so when I, when I want to express and make somebody uh, make a connection with this human subject, which is really important, especially in bust, uh, like um you kind of think it kind of needs that contrast to in order for people to make the connection with the work um yeah makes makes a lot of sense to me um now do you prefer uh like do you like working with busts over let's say figures or it's it just depends on the figure or bust i I think i like (laughs) i definitely love all all of it i'm one of these people that uh i can paint armor I can paint, I mean, like, I can paint vehicles, I can paint dioramas, figures, busts, you know, historical, fantasy, sci-fi, contemporary. Like, I love all the different uh, genres, I love all the different types of things, and I try to be good at all of it, um, rather than specializing. But I think of all of them, like, bust is probably, like, the most... um, sort of bang for my buck as far as like enjoyment and fulfillment for the amount of time you invest in it. Um, and also it's, it's a bigger, a really big scale. So you can like really pack it full of tiny detail and like, and I think also the bigger scale I like because it's access more accessible to everyone because in a certain sense, uh, you can you can start making things so small that like s- just a whole section of people can't even enjoy it, you know, because they have mm-hmm. bad eyesight or something like that, you know. <laughs> so, uh, in a sense, I I kind of like bust for that reason too, um, and if and it's challenging because, um, you really have to master the human form and human expression to. It's all about making that connection with the audience, like that human connection, um, rather than having the whole scene or a whole, like all, all the trappings of a character to communicate it. You're just down to the face and the expression and stuff and how you paint that, um, to make the connection. So, um, I really enjoy Bust. It's probably maybe my, one of my favorite things and it's, it's, um, one of the things I think I do the best. Um, so. I mean, absolutely. So the uh, your busts are so emotive. Yeah, like I, I love looking at your work and looking through your page at Contrast Miniatures. It's a, it's a lot of fun to. Uh, it's very inspirational as well, um, which is uh, appreciated by artists like me who are trying to get better. We get to look at your work and be like, okay, 
I used to be a year ago. I was, oh crap, I'm just going to give up. I can never do that. Now I'm like, okay, that's beautiful, but I want to try something. Di-. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, I, I've had to have a huge change in my mindset um, in order to kind of progress. I was kind of stuck in the, oh, I'll never do. You know what? I'm mm-hmm. never going to paint like Matt. I'm never going to paint like Roman. I'm going to have to figure out how to paint like Michael. You know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad I could, you know, help you and help inspire you to, you know, f- make that discovery in your own own life. But I mean, like, that's that's just the art. Everybody, that's your artistic journey, um, you know, and to start, everybody has to deal with it in their own personal way. Like art, your art is personal to you um, and you can find fulfillment without you know, being like the best painter in the right. world or something like that, or even, I mean, there's, there's a fulfillment and accomplishment the whole way through, you know, and there's no end to it either. You know, like art is this infinite well you can keep drawing from and finding something new, some sort of new um, fulfillment and new um, enjoyment. And I think that's a big reason why people are so attracted to it. Um, but in the, I think everybody has to face those demons of uh, self-doubt and, um, you know, and our inner critic is, can be our worst enemy, you know. Indeed. Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, one of the things I've always found interesting, too, is finding out what non-miniature paint, painter artists kind of inspire miniature painting artists. So like well, for, for you, non-miniature painting artists, do you have any that uh, are some of your favorites? Sure. Yeah. Like I, I mean, as I've gotten older, I actually have gotten really into fine art and going out to art museums and visiting the art itself and being inspired just by the skill and the, and the whole art history even too, because you can see yourself as part of this, um, like, um, tradition artistic tradition um so i mean i appreciate the work of just a wide range of artists honestly and not all of them are even related to you know fantasy and sci-fi and stuff like that I could, but uh as, as far as in the fantasy and sci-fi genre i really love frazetta frank frazetta you know he used to do the um book covers of conan and you know the, those um those paintings like in the 60s and 70s so i really like his uh fantasy art and i even did like a conan bust that was inspired by frazetta so nice. i called it bust of conan after frazetta um <laughs> <laughs> but uh other I, artists... no, don't forget he also did like national lampoon stuff too which is awesome <laughs> like they like I, they have a book that uh, that has stuff that he did for like uh uh, your uh, regular vacation, like vacation and European vacation, they're just they're they're hilarious. They're awesome paintings or artwork. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, his like practice it can be really uh, inspiring because I have a book about his sketches. You can see his sketching and his like his artistic process, and then also his use of color is like it's not, is really really good um, and and creative and can be really inspiring and very very applicable to miniatures I think. Um, but other but in addition to that, like I have a big appreciation for the impressionists. Um, I get really inspired by Rembrandt, especially for doing busts, you know, like Rembrandt can be a great, uh, inspiration for the bust painter because his portraits are so expressive and so also very, very accurate, you know, like just, he's like the master of portraiture, you know, um, maybe the, the, uh, my favorite portrait artist, uh, of, um, so, um, Rembrandt is very uh, inspiring to me. Um, uh, Van Gogh for his use of color, of course, and, and just the impressionists being able to like push your color into like interesting ways and, and not being afraid to, to make your colors like a little bit out there and like ride the edge between like, uh, like realism and, and like surrealism of, with your colors. Um, that's a, definitely something you can uh, learn um, from that artist. And then I was really inspired by um, the movie Exit Through the Gift Shop about Banksy and Shepard Fairey, the, the street artists of, um, you know, 
the the current the contemporary street artists of our time you know um so because they have a message they're trying to to say with their art which i think is inspiring and uh it's kind of um interesting I, so i really like banksy and i really like uh, shepherd fairy um so there are a couple artists that uh, contemporary artists that i'm inspired by as well um that's sort of Byron? cool. Yeah. Is somebody going to do, do you think, a Banksy thing where they're uh, at the end of a competition, the miniature implodes or something? You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, um, I don't know if we're going to do something like that. I mean, in a sense, like that 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 piece by Banksy where the, the painting kind of shreds itself or whatever, I, I feel like that was a bit of a stunt. And like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and all, even the way he represented it and the way he described it, uh, like he had uh, made this self-destructing painting that like sat on, the sh- sat on the shelf for a really long time or something. It's like, no, he had the whole thing planned out. Like, if you believe that, then, you know... <laughs> He's oh, just yeah. kind of playing with you, you know. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> like, Maybe even the something movie, where the arms even the fall movie off Exit Through the Gift Shop, which, like, is this de- documentary or whatever, uh, if you if you really watch it with a critical eye, you start to realize that it's like, hey, maybe he planned this whole movie himself. It's like this this controversy about even that part about it, you know, like because I I got really into the movie, and then my brother, who's also an artist, he's like, oh yeah, and like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he has this whole like theory about how you know it's not really a documentary, and they made the whole thing. You know, and I think it's like kind of a collect, it kind of like the truth is somewhere in between those extremes. So he's just an interesting artist for any number of reasons. But that right. particular stunt, I don't know. Like I, I, I'm sure you could have like you could have some sort of weird stunt, but maybe it wouldn't pay off in the same way as it does. No, I don't think, I don't think it would for sure. (laughs) I just had this vision of somebody like being like, Oh yes, you know, I made this, uh, here's this giant ogre. And at 1215, the arms fall off, are are going to fall (laughs) off. You know, it's something, the glue is perfectly timed to fade at that time. Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) I I think too much, you know, that's probably what the problem is. So kind of a long, uh, I don't know how long the lines it is. It's getting late, so I'm like my brain's kind of f- fading out. But I, w- I do want to ask you this: Is there a type of model or a specific model out there um, that hasn't been made that you would like to see made? And I always kind of give the example of um, I would I'm dying to see uh, Stephen King's Dark Tower figure, like miniatures from characters from that done in the J. Lee graphic novel style. Um, so it's kind of kind of finds one of my favorite writers and one of my favorite art like comic book artists at the same time. But um, I would love to see those miniatures. Is there something out there that you would like that hasn't been made that you'd like to see? Oh, well, yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I mean, of course, I, there's all sorts of pieces of pop culture that I enjoy, and I would even paint some models of of that. But I don't. I don't know, like the things that really like inspire me and to 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 make things. Um, Usually it's like some combination of the sculpt and then also an additional idea. So it's kind of hard <laughs> hard to say. One thing I one thing I will say about that though is that I I'm actually the new thing that I've been learning over the last few years is sculpting myself. So um, that and I'm doing that so that I have more um, more control over my subject matter. Okay. Right? Because I might have. Uh, uh, you can have any number of ideas, but you are kind of limited at what what you can actually achieve uh, if you're. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's part of our art form, right? Um, I don't think that like a original sculpt by you is necessarily like a better piece of art than something that where it's like you take a sculpture of another artist and you add your own art to that, you know. Um, but if you if you have one a specific idea, you know, making things from entirely from scratch is something that I'm I'm starting to do now. So this this year I'm going to have um I'm really taking that leap. I I've, I've done a few like 100% scratch built pieces and I have another one planned for this year um that but of course I'm not I'm not really at liberty to talk about it too of much course. right now. Oh, um, please. Yeah. And, but okay. it's it's contemporary though, like that's the thing. I think that maybe the genre that is maybe missing is like 
a genre that's contemporary, just like and it is more about like real issues that and real things that are happening right now, and maybe mm-hmm. and and you know real feelings and emotions and and situations. So nice. I, I like to do that. They're, they're more about a concept or and some some of that like is speculative future type stuff so you can kind of tie it into sci-fi and be talking about the issues of the day by speculating about you know the world of tomorrow um so those are some of the themes that i'm exploring and uh but then also just um about um like the theme of the project that i'm working on is is innocence oh great Um, Yeah, yeah i like that so um, I'm doing a diorama about that, and I'll be sculpting the figures myself. Now, um, and as I say, I think that the world has changed substantially too with the advent of accessibility for 3D printing, and so now we're starting to see a lot more of different things now that we may not have seen 10 years ago, you know, because a company, a big company, wasn't making them per se. So that's kind of cool too. So let me uh, let me ask you this one: um, Is there so if uh, let's say a, a paint company came to you. Now this paint might already exist because you did work for you know a company that makes paints. But I said, you know what, Matt, we're gonna make uh, a paint for you. What color would it be, and what would the name be? Oh geez, I don't know if that's even necessary. <laughs> 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 that's the thing is like I, I don't feel like that's that's necessary anymore. Like uh, to me, color is like the. It's a it's like a limited <laughs> sphere, and like I try to use them all, use as much of that sphere as I can, you know. So um, that involves using, for me, using artist paints because they have the most saturated and bright colors. Um, you can always make something darker and and uh, like um, you know uh, muddier and stuff like that, but it's hard to get saturation back and hard to get that vibrance back. So I don't know, like. Um, I end up uh, just using all different types of things. <laughs> like I think inventing new paints is kind of uh, not necessary, <laughs> and uh, yeah. like I don't, I don't know. Like I try to use all different types of colors and stuff. I don't. I try not to use like so, some artists, and there's nothing wrong with this. Might like use one paint. I'll always have this one paint in the, in their art. And this causes like their art, and sometimes this can cause their art to be more recognizable because like that color kind of ch- causes all their art to have a certain cast or a certain feel or like you know um, in it. Um, other artists like <laughs> will have a very limited palette. They'll only use you know like <laughs> to the extreme. There was like this one British artist. I can't remember. I'm trying to remember his name, but he he had like he, he his his line was I'm a simple man and I use simple tools and he had four colors that he used and that was all it was like white black yellow and red <laughs> like <laughs> right. but um for me I want to use I want to be able to use all the little crowns in the in the box but mm-hmm. I can kind of like mix whatever tone I want from. Like I think you, all you need is eight different colors to mix any color. You can't use just three primaries, um, but really you can you can kind of mix anything from from um, from six different primary colors and then one in black. Uh, no, yeah. well let me let me ask you this question with that then. Do you ever feel like like have you painted like a succession of models and gone huh? Apparently, I was obsessed with green for the last few months, or like kind of like. Do you get? Do, does that ever kind of happen to you? Um, maybe not color, but it, it, yeah, I mean that does happen actually. Like right now, <laughs> um, I actually haven't shown any of the models in in my in my some of my latest models, but they kind of have like a similar sort of feel and tone to them because I've been experimenting with like this particular process. Mm-hmm. Um, where I'll start out with like a sketch of the lighting on the figure, and then I make it really saturated and full of like super bright, vibrant color. It'll look garish, right? Like really, really bright. And then I use tones over top of that to desaturate it until it looks, you know, where I want it to be. So I've been kind of having fun with that, and 
it, it it makes it so like some areas of the model can be really like bright and like color color punched and then other parts as it as it recedes from your eye or as it like you know goes to less interesting parts of the model it will desaturate so you can kind of have fun with that but not all my models integrate that you know <laughs> um, sure no of course uh but yeah for, for me sometimes one thing i've found and it's not intentional at all is like for whatever reason water is working its way into my like all my pieces like every piece I make, like for competition that comes from the heart, like a lot, a lot of them have water in them, or fish, or like you know the ocean. I live by the ocean now. It's like I don't know why, but <laughs> you know <laughs> it's just coming out. So I don't know. It's mysterious, but <laughs> maybe yeah. that that's something similar. Yeah, lately I've been doing. I've noticed that every type of little thing I do has like a tree in it. I'm like, oh god, I gotta stop watching Bob Ross videos. You know? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, like... I say embrace it, let it happen. You know, like it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have to. You don't have to fight that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, no, it's fun, and you know, it, it's funny. Actually, it's one of the things that my all ages in the house. If a if I pop on a Bob Ross video by the end of the you know, by the end of the video everybody in the house is sitting around watching it. You know? <laughs> it's yeah. all, all the generations can kind of enjoy it. So that's pretty cool. I so, love Bob Ross. I, I grew up with him like uh it was the show I would always watch if I was sick, you know, mm-hmm. and I needed something to just like soothe my mind and my just like my whole life. It will soothe. It's so soothing, and I really just really enjoy watching it. And, I, and it makes me want to like, you know, start painting some landscapes and things like that. I've been kind of, kind of working at. I've been, I don't know, branching out in all sorts of different little like, t- different types of art that I do as hobbies now. <laughs> right. No, that's a great thing. And I'm sure each one of those kind of feeds in it. Like, you know, you learn something doing a different hobby translates back into miniature painting you know it's kind of a neat reflexive thing it really does or your appreciation for that hobby kind of like (laughs) you like learn from miniature painting so one thing i i I learned to do is knit so i i'll knit hats or like uh ended this like lace shawl for my wife you know like recently which was like a big challenge thing thing but it is kind of like this like relaxing repetition and i think miniature painting can be that as well um, especially painting for armies so it, i find these like connections and similarities um you know with other types of art and then my freehand skills have I've, I've been painting um these like really tiny free hands on pottery when we go to like um you know the you paint pottery places <laughs> You know, <laughs> I'll do that with like my wife and some of her friends, and then, and uh, you know, I'll paint these like tiny little scenes. I've even started sharing that with my followers and stuff online. I like to kind of sh- show that it's like, oh, you can have fun. Doesn't matter what type of art you're doing anymore. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> not something I'm trying to do for money. It's just kind of like for fun. And I think that like people should allow themselves to do that and just know they will feed back into their miniature painting. Sometimes you'll have a breakthrough on miniature painting doing something completely different. <laughs> I could see that. Absolutely. I, I, absolutely. You know, and I know for me in, I took your blending boot camp a couple of years ago and I kind of had an aha moment in that class. I don't know if you remember. You may, maybe you remember or not. You've taught a bunch of classes between now and then. So I just remember like, holy crap. And it was the gap. The putting the gap between the two colors in the in when you're wet, wet blending, right? When yeah. wet blending, and I had never thought about it, never saw anything ever anybody do it that way. And my, I'm still working on my blends, but they're so much better from that simple of a little. You know what I'm saying? It like, I don't know. I was kind of like, Matt, where have you been my whole life? You know, <laughs> <laughs> like I need on that uh, uh, a pocket mat saying, just do this, you'll be fine. Um, <laughs> So one of the like, pocket- that could, you could that I could do that for you. I find that like that class like people have big breakthroughs in, um, and especially since it it doesn't focus on just like one type of blending. Like there's only one white way. There's like it it teaches like a bunch of different ways. So I think that it can be really great for that. Oh, go ahead. 
No, no, I, I was just going to say, for me, as a personal level, I had to say thank you. I can say thank you, thank you, thank you to the cows. <laughs> that was a huge help. Um, well, thank and, you. Uh, like, uh, it's it's uh, gratifying and rewarding to hear that. So um, I, that's what teaching is about. That's why I keep doing it, <laughs> is that I can see the the positive things that can, effect it can have on other people. Yeah. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, the podcast motto is better, braver, happier. So I was wondering if there is a, a last tip that you could give to our listeners kind of to help them down that road. Yeah, I think be kind to yourself and, uh, and um, yeah, like judge, judge your work and your uh, progress against yourself. You know, so don't strip your models. Uh, have them there to like, remind yourself where you've been and the growth that you've made. Um, and try not to just put yourself under such pressure. Like sometimes um, the fun and enjoyment of the hobby can be tainted by looking at the best work out there. And that's some, it's something kind of sad, sad on multiple levels there because you're tearing yourself down by giving yourself unrealistic expectations, you know, because you don't go the people you don't see all the work that person has put in, you know, basically committing their life to, you know, the study of art and, and doing these things. Um, you like, they, they don't have any sort of natural talent. I mean, uh, they all had to work for it too. So, um, but you don't get to see that. You only get to see, you know, <laughs> their work when they, when they get really good or whatever. So, um, just realize that you're part you're on the same path that they are on you know um is one thing but then also it's kind of sad on the other level where it's like you lose your enjoyment of seeing these like fantastic uh pieces of art by comparing yourself to that you know <laughs> um so you kind of like lose your enjoyment for this thing that you're passionate about and uh, I can see that, and sometimes I see people go through that and then come out the other side where they have to rediscover it. So I, in some ways, I think that that happens for everybody. But if you can be aware of it and kind of, um, you know, fight your internal dialogue or, you know, come to terms with that dialogue, um, I think that that's where the um, enjoyment comes from the increased enjoyment can come from and also um, a way to um, you know paint more bravely which is like um, my motto as well um, uh, right. yeah uh, so and I think that that's you know a lesson that you have to learn but um, to be conscious of it and have patience and be kind to yourself well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. So tell me, tell the listeners where they can find you. Yeah, um, you can find me. The easiest way to find my work is to go to my website, contrastminiatures.com, um, or to find me through Contrast Miniatures on Facebook, um, where I also will post. Um, if you want to find me on Instagram, my, I'm at, at, Matt, at Matt DiPietro Art. We'll have links uh, to all that stuff in the show notes as well, so that way people can just click and go. <laughs> yeah, and then if you want to watch my tutorial videos, I'm on uh, Patreon at Miniature Monthly, um, where I make tutorial videos along with Aaron Lovejoy and Elizabeth Beckley. So there's, you get three artists for the price of one, basically, <laughs> uh, and it can be it's a really great. Uh, uh, Patreon. So, um, if you want my, you know, uh, video tutorials, they're at the ten dollar level on Miniature Monthly. Um, so that that's another way they can find me. So I'm I'm in a lot of different places, and um, and then of course if you see m me at uh, at the com at conventions when that starts back up, I traveled to a lot of conventions throughout the U.S. But you can always uh, learn from me through the videos, private coaching, or online coaching. So yeah, so if private like coaching, coaching yeah. private coaching and online coaching. Can they contact you through your webpage? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Perfect. Um, but I also have a couple slots through Manager Monthly for online coaching that they can they can sign up for too. So you can get the videos and online coaching all in one thing. Um, oh, or 
but if you if you don't want if you want to just like you know go straight to online coaching they can uh, they can contact me through the website and get set up through that too so there's lots of different ways i try to make it easy for you you know just reach out for, to me if you have an idea or for a commission or anything really um, i'm always willing to talk and make it easy you know well thank you so much for taking the time out to in, uh, do the interview matt i really appreciate it well, thank you, Michael, for having me on and uh, giving me the opportunity to, you know, reach some people and uh, have a good good chat. I've, I've really enjoyed myself. So, Dan and I would like to thank Matthew Pietro from Contrast Miniatures for joining us today. You could follow him on Instagram and Facebook at Contrast Miniatures. His videos are also available at the ten dollar pledge level on Patreon for Miniature Monthly. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Listening to Paint Dry. If you have questions, comments, thoughts, you want to show us what kind of stuff you're working on, or tell us the proper way for painting any of the colors we discussed this evening, you can contact us at listening to paint dry at gmail.com. Subscribe, like, and follow us wherever you get your podcast and milk. Follow your dreams to become a better, braver, happier painter. I'm following my dreams. See ya. Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan is a production of LTPDWMD. All rights reserved. No portion of this recording may be used without the express written consent of the host. The music is Death by a Thousand Questions by Springtide. Download from the free music archive on a non-commercial attribution share alike basis. All views and opinions expressed in the show are solely the views and opinions of the person who said them. All celebrity voices, if any, were impersonated and done so poorly.